the city in the Bronx. And uh, I was just, I just turned 15 when uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked. And all of us kids were right, anxious to go, even though we were not old enough. So when I turned 17, I enlisted in the Navy, uh, halfway through my senior year in high school. The deal in those days was that if you had good grades and you had a skill that the military needed, you could enlist without finishing the senior year, and then your parents could pick up your diploma at the time they would have had to graduate. Uh, so that's what I did. I had gone to a, uh, being a depression kid, uh, there was a college, uh, it was not an option for many of us, but later on after the war, thank God for the GI Bill, that changed. But anyway, uh, uh, so we, we all wanted to be either police officers or firemen or work for the New York Telephone Company or something <laughs> secure. So uh, I, I took the test and got accepted to Samuel Gompis Vocational Technical High School and I took electronics and electrical and so on. So when I uh, volunteered to the Navy, they took me right away, sent me to electrician's made school after boot camp, which was a review of what I had learned in three years, uh, crammed into four months. So they thought I was really smart, you know. <laughs> I had all that stuff already. And I was assigned to a, a, a small Navy ship, a destroyer escort. Destroyer escorts, the main purpose of them was the Battle of the Atlantic, which was the longest battle in World War II. It started September the 1st, 1939, two years roughly before the United States was officially in a war, the reason I, I'll get to why I said officially, uh, and it lasted till May the 8th, 1945, which was VE Day, when the war in Europe ended. Now, during that time, the Germans had what they called undersea boats. That means undersea boats. And that's where the term U-boat comes from. They were submarines. And their job was to cut the supply line from the United States to England and Russia, Murmansk, Russia, and uh, later on to France and when our own troops were on the European continent. Unfortunately, they did a very good job because we were not prepared. In that time, they sank 2,853 Allied merchant ships and neutral ships uh, with a loss of about 75,000 men, mostly civilians. Uh, also about 150 military ships, destroyers, destroyer escorts, troop transports, like the USS Dorchester, which lost about a thousand men. Uh, so we were losing, well, that was about 15,000 more fatalities. Uh, we were losing the Battle of the Atlantic because we weren't prepared for it. Uh, they were sinking more ships than we could build and they were building more submarines or U-boats than we were sinking. The Navy was a little asleep at the switch there for two reasons. They didn't really realize how serious the Atlantic was uh, we could have lost the war in Europe. Nobody knows, and I've never seen any figures as to how much longer did the war in Europe last because so much of the cargo and supplies that we needed ended up at the bottom of, uh, bottom of, uh, of the Atlantic Ocean. For example, in the earlier part of the war, 1942, once Hitler declared war on the United States, I often wonder why he was so stupid to do that. Well, the reason he did, I think, was because now he could attack our ships. Uh, we did lose a couple of ships before Pearl Harbor. There was a destroyer, the Reuben James, that was sunk in the Atlantic. We were escorting the British convoys. And uh, two other ships, uh, one apiece, patrol craft, the smallest ship. So finally in 1943, the United States Navy started building the small ships called destroyer escorts. They were about 300 feet long, about 37 feet wide, had a crew of 200 enlisted men, mostly teenagers. Like Nancy said, there was a shortage of men. So they actually took the kids out of high school and uh, sent them to boot camp for eight or 10 weeks, and then out they went, unless they went to a service school. So I ended up on a destroyer escort, uh, the DE-182, DE stands for destroyer escort, and uh, the USS Gustafson. We served initially in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, taking convoys across the ocean to protect the uh, convoys. Convoys consisted of, maybe at the time I was in, 1944-45, about 100 ships. They would line up in rows 
and we would be on the outside to the ease up forward and to uh, aft uh, to protect the convoy. And later on, when they had more, they also added what they called uh, Hunter Culler Groups, which consisted of a baby aircraft carrier and four DEs. We, uh, any convoys that I was in, we never lost a ship because we had more strength by this time. Now our crew consisted of 200 enlisted men, mostly 17, 18, 19 years old. Our officers were a little older, they were college graduates, the commissioned officers. The average age of the officers on my ship was 40, uh, 26, because the, the captain was 42 years old. We called him the old man. <laughs> and we had a few fellows, most of us were 18, 19. We had a few in their 20s. They were usually craftsmen, electricians, auto mechanics, carpenters, any skill. And they would get them into the Navy inside a side of six months. They became chiefs because they were building ships fast. Today, it would take you 20 years and you may not become a chief. There are just not enough opportunities. Um, I have a, the Battle of the Atlantic didn't get much publicity. People didn't know, including people in New Jersey, how close the enemy was. They were right outside of New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, all up and down the East Coast. They would, at night, the glow of the city lights would cast a shadow of the ships would be silhouetted against that glow. If you go outside here, I don't know if you can see it from here, from where I live, you look over to Morristown, you can see the, the lights of the city the glow. So the ships were silhouetted against that, and the submarines could just shoot them down. They called it the happy times until about 1943. Uh, then the government asked Atlantic City, Miami, other places to subdue the lights, and they resisted. They didn't want to frighten the people away from these tourist places. But finally, Uncle Sam said, you're going to do it or else we'll come in and put them off. At home, at night, you had to draw your, your shades. Probably none of you are that old that you remember this. But uh, you pulled your shades down at night so the light wouldn't shine out. Uh, the headlights on the cars had their upper half uh, painted black. The street lights, they were domed lights. They were painted the top half black to prevent the, uh, the uh, light from shining up and creating a, a haze. Uh, so that was uh, some help. Um, there was an event that happened that was very important and people uh, uh, couldn't be told about it because it was a very important secret and that was a hunter killer group, a baby aircraft carrier, the USS Guadalcanal, it had about 25 airplanes on it, 12 fighter planes and 12, 12 or 13 torpedo planes and four DEs and the commander of that group his objective was to capture a German submarine instead of just sinking it and try to get a hold of the code books and the, uh, uh, what is the machine they had, the uh, Enigma. Enigma machine, thank you. And they succeeded in doing that. Uh, I have a display over here that a friend of mine made up, he was involved in that, I was not. And uh, uh, the history of how they did it and whatnot is over there and I'll just point out one letter if you have a chance later, take a look at it. It was called the U-505, and it's now on display since about 1950 in Chicago, the uh, Museum of Science and Industry. But every man, and there had to be about 2,000 men involved in this, every DE had 200 men, we had four DEs, that's 800, and the aircraft carrier had about 1,000, had to sign a letter and I'll just read you the last uh, word. You're not allowed to tell this to anyone, even an admiral, your parents, your wife, your girlfriend, nobody, on the penalty of a general court martial, which could result in punishment by death. Nobody out of those 2,000 men divulged that, that secret. Now, what was life on the destroyer escort like? It was very crowded. 200 men jammed in, we were, uh, Bunks were three deep. My job was in the engine room. The ship happened to be propelled by diesel electric. We had four diesel engines, the type they used on the railroads in those, in those days, generating uh, four generators manufactured by General Electric. And then on each screw or propeller, we had two electric motors. So the final step was an electric, the electric motors propelled that ship. 
And uh, that's why they had the electricians like myself had to control that. So it was interesting. When the war, uh, well, I have some pictures here of our crew, and when you look at them, if you have a chance, it'll remind you of McHale's Navy. <laughs> we were very informal on the small DE. In fact, so few men, 200, we became friends for life. My ship is having its 66th annual reunion, consecutive reunion, uh, this summer. So that's how we, we became lifelong friends. Uh, I know a little short of time here. This is a, it's not a real bullet, it, it was a real bullet, but this is the smallest caliber gun we had. It was called a uh, uh, 20 millimeter. Our largest gun was a three inch gun. The range was about five miles. The trouble with that was that the German submarines had five inch guns. Their range was 10 miles. So they could be up at the surface and reach us and we couldn't reach them. So again, that was another thing that we overlooked. Uh, the powers that be. So later in the war, they started building DEs with five inch guns on them. Do uh, you have any questions that you might? Oh. By the way, I'm a tour guide. Oh, Pardon me? I have one concerning the submarines. Yeah. Their submarines were off our coastline, right? Yes, they were right. Uh, Where were our submarines? Were we in Hamlin? We had submarines. Most of our submarines were in the Pacific. Oh, I see. All right. We actually, in World War II, we lost 57 submarines uh, in the Pacific mostly. And the disadvantage our submarines had, for two years the torpedoes didn't work too well. There was a flaw in the torpedoes. And they would, right after Pearl Harbor, the submarines were about the only thing we had left in the Pacific. There weren't many ships that, that were operable because of the damage at Pearl Harbor. So the submarines held the line. In fact, the submarine, those guys are really heroes. It's the, da the most dangerous job. They sank more ships, the submarines did, than the entire US Navy during the war. Yeah, so the submarines were, were it. Now the Germans, by the time the war ended, about 85% of the German submariners lost their lives. In the beginning, they called it the happy times. It was like taking candy from baby. There was no, no, we had no protection. We were using fishing boats, yachts, and so on to try to uh, uh, protect the convoys, but we couldn't. In the early days of the war, maybe a, a convoy of 60 some odd ships would leave and maybe half of them would get through. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. What was the name of that um, 505 that he captured all the papers and things from? It did not have a name, but the, the U-boats went by number. All right, U505 was the number. Now the ships have had names. Now the ships' names, there were a few of them there. The Flaherty was one, a friend of mine was on that. The Guadalcanal was the uh, aircraft carrier, and I don't know all the other, the other three. But U-boats, and our submarines have names. Yeah, yeah. And they're usually, when, at that time, they were named after the fish, like yeah. the sailfish, the yeah. tarpon, and so on. Yeah. yeah, but the, Ju the German U-boats, as far as I know, did not have names. And that U-boat is in, is in, in the whole piece? In yes, it's in its entirety in the uh, uh, Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. And what happened to the crew? They became... They were captured. Uh, what happened was, they start, uh, our, our ship started dropping the uh, depth charges, mm -hmm. which are set at a predetermined depth, and when you reach that depth, they'll explode. So the submarine came up, and it was damaged. So the rear end of the sub was underwater, and just the bow was sticking out. So then the, the commander uh, ordered that, don't shoot anything at them that's gonna sink the sub. And they just shot at it with the idea of getting the crew to jump off the submarine, off the U-boat, which they did. Only one German sailor was killed in that event. And we picked up the rest of them. We had three motor whale boats that went out. One went onto the ship, with the idea of, uh, uh, they didn't know, was it booby trapped? So they went down into the conning tower and they had to close the conning tower because the water was washing over it and more water would have entered the sub, the U-boat, and sank it. So they went down and the Germans had opened up a, a sea valve, about an eight inch in diameter a cover and the water was gushing in. So the fellow was there, he said, well, 
it probably will be trapped or I'll never know, so I'll pick it up. And it, fortunately, it wasn't. And there were some other incident, incident, instances of possible booby traps, but the wind-up was the German captain told them later that they didn't have time to set the booby traps. But anyway, because of that, we had been reading, when I say we, the U.S. Navy, had been reading the German codes, but it took a few days to analyze them. And I think some of the waves were assigned to that work, decoding the secret the messages. Mm -hmm. The Germans realized that we were reading their messages. So they took the Atlantic Ocean and made a grid out of it, like a checkerboard. And in each square in that grid, the code changed every day. Mm -hmm. So by the time we translated it, it was worthless. Mm -hmm. But by capturing these books with all the lists of all the days and each square and what the code was, mm -hmm. we were able to read the German messages as fast as, uh, as uh, the Germans could. And what happened to all the other subs that were up and down the coast? Did they get the... Uh, Most of them were sunk. Sunk. Yeah, eventually. Some were captured at the end of the war when they surrendered. Yeah. They uh, towed some of them into the United States. And uh, by the way, this uh, uh, U-505, they were going to tow it into uh, Casablanca. But Casablanca was a nest of spies from every country. So at the last minute it was changed, and they towed it to Bermuda. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they did, the Germans had developed an acoustic torpedo. When it was fired, it would lock on to the noise of the of sound of the ship's propellers, and you couldn't shake it. So uh, that was a pretty ingenious invention, uh, when you think of it 70 years ago. So they, they, uh, on the sub were some of these acoustic torpedoes. The USS Slater, which is the only DE left and float in the United States out of 563, it's up in Albany. I'll tell you a little more about that in a minute. Uh, they took that uh, one of those torpedoes and brought it to uh, uh, the Navy in the United States, and they were able to analyze it and come up with a, uh, a gimmick to uh, uh, elude it. And what they ended up with is, like on our ship, we had a long steel cable let out about a thousand feet and uh, you know the wind chimes you have well we had pipes and a, and a five piece of metal and dragged that behind the ship and made a lot of noise so that the torpedoes would go to that instead of to the ship <laughs> so uh, i'm a volunteer tour guide there were 563 d's built during world war ii there's only one left in the united states and it's in albany new york on the hudson river and it's been restored to the way it looked in August 1945. So if you're ever going up to Albany or any in that neighborhood, excuse, excuse me, uh, you can give me a call, my phone, uh, number's in the phone book, and I'll take you on a tour around the ship. Um, it's uh, like going back into a time capsule from 1945. Now, when the ship was in the Atlantic, it had, I have a model here of it, you can take a look at it. Uh, it had three torpedo tubes and those ammunition that I showed you, the guns were single barrel. They took the torpedo tubes off and they put more uh, anti-aircraft up. And uh, the, the single barrel, the uh, 20 millimeter guns were made double barrel. So we increased our anti-aircraft tremendously because of the kamikaze planes. That was just the idea. As the war in Europe wound down, all of these ended up in the Pacific, including mine. Fortunately, uh, we all thank uh, President Truman for making the decision uh, to drop the bomb and end the war once and for all. Uh, the Battle of Okinawa, there were 350 American Navy ships hit by the suicide planes, and about 15 sunk, but many of them were, were damaged. The invasion of Japan would have been very doubtful whether we'd even have enough ships and it would have been maybe a million American casualties and a couple of million Japanese so it was the right thing to do no question about it and we were training for that invasion and uh, my ship and most of the DEs were would have been in a first wave on the uh, southern island of Kushu and uh, that was scheduled for November the 1st 1945 and uh, fortunately we didn't have to do that were the 
was well, I think they were smart, and they were very good scientists and engineers, no question about it. Um, I don't know if their submarines were any better. They had more of them, didn't they? They had more of them, and that's what they needed. Yeah. They knew. See, we didn't learn our lesson in World War One. We had the same problem. And, uh, their torpedoes worked from the start pretty much. Yeah, ours <laughs> did. That's right. That's a little bit of an advantage right there. Yeah. So... Uh, uh, we were very slow in the Atlantic to realize, because most of the uh, uh, money was going to uh, the Navy, the war in the Pacific was a naval air war, and they needed a lot of ships, so they were concentrating on that, and uh, uh, not really uh, thinking too much about the problem in the Atlantic until it was too late. That one. And then the other one is a copy of the uh, June 6th invasion. Uh, the D-Day invasion. By the way, these ships were considered expendable. They would, uh, um, for instance, uh, the invasion of southern France, a friend of mine was on a, a DE there, the American Navy didn't know where the guns were in the mountains of southern France. So they sent the DE in to draw the fire so they could spot where the enemy guns were. Our ship uh, had a, I'll just take one more minute, uh, Uruguay, Montevideo, Uruguay. Mm -hmm. There was a, a revolution down there, and they didn't know was the new regime going to be on our side or some or the German side. So they sent our ship in to see what would happen. Well, the mayor of uh, Montevideo ran a big party for the crew. <laughs> <laughs> that turned out okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, one more thing, if I can. The reason I wore uniform tonight. There's a little more to the uniform than meets the eye. You know about bell-bottom pants, right? Well, when we went to the Pacific, they told us, if you have to abandon ship, don't take off your shoes, because if you end up in Japanese hands, they're not going to give you any shoes. So we were trained in boot camp to abandon ship, take our pants off with the shoes on. Why would you take your pants off? <laughs> well, you would tie a knot in the legs on both legs, take the pants, put them over the back of your head with both hands, go like that, and fill them up with air. That would be like water wings. Also, this hat, you turn that inside out, that would help, it would hold air. I don't know how long the dungarees would uh, remain waterproof, not very long. And the other thing, in boot camp, you had to swim at least 50 feet to pass. If you didn't pass, then you would have to go every night until you land, and they reason you have to know at least 50 feet, how to, how to swim 50 feet is you're not going to swim back to the coast of the United States, but you might be able to swim 50 or 100 feet to get something that's floating and save yourself. Anyway, uh, as you look at the artifacts, contemplate the fact that this honor roll represents a lot of families in this town and in this township and they deserve the respect. Uh, this honor roll ought to be put somewhere where it's uh, seen more frequently. Yes. It's in the attic of the Phoenix house and we got them to bring it over here. It must weigh about 200 pounds so I'm just going to put it up but you can look at it the way it is. But a lot of familiar names on there. Thank you very much Leo and thank you very much Nancy. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you.